ladies and gentlemen, Damas Miera. My talk is entitled Janine Allen Spies, Brasher, Alchemist, sorry, Miner, Scavenger, Lantern Swinger, and Turnstone. It is already an exceptional event when a highly rated artist such as Janine Allen Spies presents a solo exhibition aptly entitled The Visionary Brusher Game. But when that exhibition is part of her doctoral thesis, entitled Interactive Playing with Pigment and Material Enlightenment, it is similar to visiting the house an architect designed for himself. A summary of influences in the course of a life and a career dedicated to art, its creation, its teaching, and sharing it with like-minded students and colleagues. For all the seriousness of the enterprise, a PhD is a long-term, expensive, exhausting undertaking. The title of this exhibition, The Visionary Brush Again, is also indicative of the important element of play, of ludic activities in Janine's process of making and creating art. She not only wants you to watch her play, but to play yourself, to handle the objects in her imaginarium, to see the metamorphosis of sewing machine parts becoming prothesis. Artists through the ages have given us glimpses of the interior of their studios. One thinks of Gustave Courbet's artist studio and the studio of the painter by Giorgio Vasari. Janine has made her studio part of the exhibition. By studio, she does not mean easel and palette. The studio for a 21st century artist who is also an academic and a thesis director for other gifted artists and here I would like to mention Dort Vermeulen as this exhibition is also a homage to her, who is firmly rooted in South African and African soil, but acutely aware of her Irish heritage and all the myths and folklore which became her legacy by birth. That studio is not only a place where the artist works, not just a physical place, but also a psychological space, a place of healing, creation, play and alchemy. This is where ideas, inspiration, memories, indignation, fear and sadness are transformed into art. In my title, I used the words brasher, alchemist, miner, scavenger, lantern swinger and turnstone. These are only some of the activities which make up Janine's artistic exploration. One of the most extraordinary objects in her imaginarium what you see is not a cabinet of curiosities, as you do not marvel at it, you're intrigued by it. You are invited to link the objects displayed in it with the artworks on the walls, is the beautiful handmade broom created for her by a befriender who sells them on a cyborg. Janine sees herself as a brusher. This object is a metaphor for her main activity, adopted from Walter Benjamin, who appropriated the concept from Brecht. Like a Benjaminian philosopher, she believes in brushing history against the grain. Because of the etymological link between brush and broom, sweeping is akin to wielding the painter's tool. Like Salinger's catcher in the rye, she salvages, contrary to what seems to be a nationwide activity in libraries, i.e. the weeding of books. The volumes in her imaginarium were all salvaged from a university library. Because she is a firm believer in luck, the discovery process and serendipity, she was struck by the coincidence that the topics of many of the weeded books, especially those on Marxism, were the same as those which Hitler destroyed by fire. There was also a slim volume by Heusenhaar and the Schadewe van Morgen, the famous and much quoted uh, games theorist. Although the more famous work is Homo Ludens, Game theory actually originated in a short, odd chapter in this book. As an artist, she could not fail to recognize this serendipitous instance when an irresponsible act of weeding led to a discovery which was of great personal value to her as far as the original game's concept is concerned, but also the title, as she concerns herself with the shadow of enlightenment. The discoveries did not end there. Books on cybernetics were also added to her collection, almost by supernatural means. Although the books were weeded by uh, human hands, the fact that she came upon them, and upon those specific books, was pure chance. At other university libraries, it is not called weeding, but decolonization. With the former, books may still be salvaged. With the latter, books are often pulped without providing the opportunity to preserve them in any way. 
The artist, as Janine understands it, is thus also a preserver, and the Imaginarium starts resembling a small personalised library. The Imaginarium is crowned with a collection of umbrellas, used as antennas, photographers' life reflectors, and maybe just objects forgotten by Mary Poppins. The Imaginarium is not an instruction manual, it is not an explanation of the artworks, but it gives some idea of the artist's inner world, her personality and convictions. For example, Janine sees herself as a scavenger, someone who finds objects which through the alchemistic artistic process can be made into art, often by using technology. The viewer must thus understand alchemy in its widest possible sense here, ranging from the tangible shelves of the Imaginarium to the works created by digitizer on the opposite wall. Janine sought to experiment with the assistance of her MA student at the time, Dort Vermeulen, whether the body movements, the French have such a wonderful word for this, gestuel, from geste or gesture, of the artist are modified by the way we now use our smart smartphones and iPads, and whether the very way in which a brush or a pencil is held has been irrevocably changed by technology. The prints and videos in which Dot, as playful and fairy-like as her mentor, lent herself to the experiment, donning the wig and the oriental jacket you see in the Imaginarium, like some skin shed by a selkie or seal woman in Irish folklore. More about the selkies later. Janine sees herself as a miner, a prospector. She's not looking for riches. As you can see from the shelves of her Imaginarium, her treasures are found objects or sale bargains, but for depth, as the viewer ob observes in the work entitled Old Dog. It features the General Assembly Hall of the United Nations in New York, with a superimposed image of an old dog, a metaphor for the institution's inability to keep peace. If the dog ever was Cerberus, that period of being a successful watchdog has long passed. The artist has captured the essence of the 1970s decor with its aura of fatigue and used the principles of holography to superimpose the dog's head. It is a fine, delicate work with intricate detail creating a three-dimensional effect. Janine keeps an open mind when it comes to aliens and has added a few spaceships, just to be on the safe side. The two blue works featuring Dort Vermeulen show the influence of the media theorists in this techno-critical exhibition. Here, Janine explores users a change of movement according to the way in which cell phones are handled, especially the use of thumbs. The machine determines human movement, a debate which even rages as far as the use of implements by primitive peoples is concerned. In her own exper experiments, conducted with Dot's help, she concluded that the artist's movements are unique. Equally precious is, of course, the fact that Dot's gestures have been captured here for eternity. Dot is using a Wacom pad or a digitizer and a visionary stylus, complete with a small antenna, to capture messages from space. These unique gestures are also an example of brushing against the grain, which is the greater context of which in the greater context of the exhibition implies that the gestures of creating art and the world are the same and thus attain a macrocosmic level. The color blue in these works is symbolic and a reminder that we are the offspring of the blue the blue beard of legend. The works thus contain references to our violent past but also to Chinese imperialism in the local minds and to the Japanism which was prevalent in European and especially French art at the turn of the last century. Here, however, oriental exoticism has lost its attraction. The small career town of Richmond, which houses an important conceptual art museum, has contributed in no small way to this exhibition. On the annual student excursion to Richmond, Janine visits the local dump, where she finds the beautiful bottles you see in the crate-like uh, crate collections. The owner curator asked her to add her collections to the museum. The Richmond collection includes a work of crumpled dollar notes sold as toilet paper in a local supermarket in one of the poorest towns in the country. The painting-like photograph was printed on special diffusing cotton paper. The table laid out near the extraordinary drawing of a turnstone bird 
features one of the most intimate glimpses into the artist's imaginarium, as it contains elements from her own personal life, starting with a faded family photograph of the six Allen sisters in their sacred happy place, Laurie's Bay, near Port Elizabeth, dominated by the memory of their mother, who passed away when the children were very young. To the Irish Mr. Allen, a farmer from the Catberg, who had lost his land to the Siskai homeland, this part of the coast is where they rebuilt their life after she had gone. Mrs. Allen, who looked like an Irish beauty, although she was not Irish herself, could write shorthand, a coded language, if ever there was one. The books on display come from the family collection, bookshops and scrapyards. Now, selfs a handleiding for Afrikaanse snelskrif, wat met die huidige taalbeleid in die land ook beskou kan word as a reaksie tegen die geschiedenis. The video installation shows a competition between a typewriter and a stenography machine, prompting reflections on the lapse of time. Technology speeds up time. Artists prefer to slow it down. Janine wrote her Russia Manifesto on the table in shorthand, which is quite a process. What she wrote is far removed from the sexist and sometimes racially biased exercises in the shorthand manuals. She penned an alchemistic recipe a ludic list of ingredients uh, which those of you not familiar with shorthand may read in one of the books. Janine is first and foremost a beachcomber who considers the gifts from the ocean delivered with the flotsam and jetsam as serendipitous events. One of the most important and personal works on display here is the drawing of the turnstone bird. This small creature can do extraordinary things, turn around stones in its search for food, but also corpses. This is linked to what was believed to have been, been an urban legend, but turned out to be the truth. Laurie's Bay was the Allen children's heterotopia, to use the term coined by Michel Foucault, as well as that of the Irish Dr. Dean, whose daughter drowned in the swimming pool while he was taking a nap. This haunted house of her youth, where she played and took people on guided tours, was thus also a place of mourning, similar to her own home. Serendipity helped her to find the doctor's autobiography, entitled The Turnstone, which provided confirmation and new information. Dr. Dean chose the bird as a title for his book because it migrates between Ireland and South Africa, where it even moves further north, all the way to the Free State mine dumps. It is not only a miner, but also a scavenger. The viewer can thus almost consider the artwork inspired by the turnstone as a self-portrait of Janine herself. Like the bird, she is a discoverer who can search for the will of the wisp. The paper chosen for this work, limestone, also has its own symbolic uh, importance. The photographs linked to Laurie's Bay and the link between the history of the two Irish families in South Africa feature Janine as the performer and her husband Yaku as the photographer. Fascinated by box cameras from pre previous eras, they use a, a form of pinhole photography to show Janine performing as a silkie on the beach. Silkies, or seal women, are caught by fishermen who can only ensure their constancy by removing their seal skins. If they were to find the, the, the skins again, the call of the sea would be irresistible and they would leave. The beautiful coats in the central space, embroidered by hand and machine, can be considered Janine's seal skin to a certain extent. The coat features the artist's motto, Telam texere, et retexere, do and undo, reweave and unweave, play and unplay. It also contains shorthand. The best example on display of the seriousness with which Janine lives up to her motto is her portrait of Anin Boysen, which is done through the fabric of an old fisherman's jersey and metaphorically through the fabric of society. The beachcomber artist found old fisherman's jerseys on the beach and wove the face of this, this teenager, who was the victim of what was probably the most atrocious murder ever committed in the country, into the jersey with a digitizer. The result is an extremely hopeful work where reweaving can take place through art. Another theme is that of stamps, which is also a way for Janine to pay homage to Lord Vermeulen's concept of posting art. Janine's own interpretation is linked to a stamp collection she inherited from her father. She has created oversized stamps with historical significance. 
Azania is of course not only a synonym for South Africa, it covers a much la larger part of the African continent and is something of a utopia. However, the more people dream about utopia, the more fascist elements invade this dream territory, as can be seen in the colouring and other elements taken from Nazi stamps. Janine has a great admiration for Emily Hophouse and has reworked the book on the suffering of war in her own way, true to her motto of weaving and unweaving, telam, texere and retexere. She has added different images to it and invites comments from viewers who are also allowed to undo the printed letters. Her soundtrack for her own version of the book is Pink Floyd's Emily Play. To her, history repeats itself. Pain is not unique and she illustrates it by juxtaposing refugees and workers on open trucks and references to Sharpeville, Marikana and the Anglo-Boer War. There is also a moving photograph entitled Evacuee of a contemporary South African refugee camp. Herself a miner and a scavenger, Janine takes an interest in real miners. Uh, read the clippings she uses in works like Blue One and Blue Two. And especially in the Zama Zamas, her next project, entitled Eureka, about illegal mine workers, will be researched in Kimberley. The holy foolishness photographs of Janine in her alchemist's coat, swinging a lantern to attract attention to the harm done to old buildings by mining companies, were also taken in Kimberley. More discoveries await the viewer in the back room, where Janine's animation, Deliverance, can be viewed, and where he or she is invited to ludic activities with 3D spectacles. I conclude. This is an exhibition which has also brought magic, alchemy and ludic activity into the gallery space. It is an exhibition which more than anything else confirms the authenticity and originality of the artist who uses technology in ways its inventors could never have dreamed of but takes her place in the line of artists across the ages who have used the tools of art in a certain way. When everyone fails us, we can trust artists because they belong to a supernatural group of beings who are in touch with different forces. Janine Allen Spies invites you to play, to find your own associations between what you see on the walls and what is exhibited on the flat surfaces in this space. You cannot but be bewitched, charmed, moved by what has been achieved by the brush and the stylus. Glass bottles mined from the Richmond soil have found a new function above ground. Giant-sized stamps have been detached from their usual function and given a new timeless and priceless function. A childhood memory of a haunted house, the playground of choice of a small Irish South African girl who did not know then that she would be called upon to be an intermediary between different worlds, turned out to be not an urban legend, but a true story of loss and redemption. From tonight, and until the closing of the exhibition, this is a sacred place, a place of healing, understanding and creativity. It is a place where the viewer can gaze into the past through the glass surface of a camera lens which captures the artist as an Irish seal woman, and where somewhere in a still not too distant past, another young girl is mimicking the gestures of art making. Through the screen, we see the act of creation through a looking glass. We see Dort van Meelen repeating the age-old movements of hand, arm and leg until the end of time. And there is something quite consoling in these almost hypnotic gestures, as though a community of artists, whether they be alchemists, brushers or lantern swingers, um, uh, uh, ensure us, um, uh, in, um, ensure the viewer from uh, beyond the glass, canvas or paper that there are still some people in tune with the various worlds and that we are not alone. According to Irish legend, seal women can only be wed if their seal skins are peeled off and hidden from them. But Irish Janine Allen from Port Elizabeth, whose natural element is the sea, has traded her seal skin for an alchemist's coat which she dons and doffs as she fancies. There is nowhere else she would like to go. Her life and her art are here. I now declare this exhibition open.